simple and not so simple test gear for the microwaver and a very brief look at how to use it. This is a, a, a massive s topic and I didn't know where to stop. So you stop me if you think it's gone on too long. I've called it an alternative to operating because there's one thing about this uh, side of the hobby, it becomes very addictive. As my wife has constantly complained uh, about the amount of test gear that's now filling my shack and spilled over into my double garage, shed and other room at the side of this. This is actually in the basement of the house, the cellar. Uh, but I have another cellar packed up to the ceiling with stuff I haven't used for about 20 years. So it can become extremely addictive. Be warned uh, and take note from my mistakes to just have the minimum of test gear to start with. When I got into microwaves, I had very, very little test gear indeed. In fact, probably had none apart from a multimeter, an AVO-type multimeter I might have in those days, none of these modern digital things. The talk I'm giving is going to cover these particular aspects. Why do we bother testing and what actually needs testing on a microwave front? What test gear do I already have? You'd be surprised how much useful test gear you've got in your shack, even if you've never been into microwaves. You've got some very basic stuff that's still needed. You don't check out your, your old AVO, for example. This is a use for an AVO, definitely. So you've probably got a lot of basic test gear. Then I'm going to have a look at simple stuff you can actually make yourself. It may be dated, it may go back two decades, but it will get you started and put you in the ballpark when you come to adjusting some microwave equipment. For example, over here, some of you may have seen it already, is my uh, 5.7 gig transverter, which is basically a DB6NT system, which I'm proud to say I made from a kit. You can't do that now because it's stopped providing the kits. And uh, I put all this together, quite a few other modules I have to make, and of course you have to test it. Well, the beauty about DB6NT kits, you can get away with just a multimeter and an, and an AVO and, and tune the whole thing up with it. But if you're starting doing what Byrne is doing, I showed you earlier with the LMBs, you've got to have a bit more sophistication with your test equipment. But it shouldn't put you off, that's what I'm trying to say. If I can make that, that was the very first proper transverter I made, then you can make it. Because I'm not a scientist, I'm not in the business, I'm not in electronics, I was a humble high school geography teacher. Which helps me to get, not get lost on the hilltops. I'll be looking at some advanced test equipment and then what we really need to test on the microwave side of things. I'll be showing you some homebrew stuff and some software alternatives as well, just a brief mention of those. You don't even have to have any hardware, it's on the internet, you can download programs to use. Then finally at the end, a look at what everybody seems to think, seems to think is the uh, holy grail of any test equipment, the spectrum analyzer. So why do we test? Well, the obvious one is to check how well our gear's working. This is a shot taken at a fairly sophisticated testing center which will be here tomorrow at the round table. This is taken at the Martlesham mic microwave round table a couple of years back. And the man with the, uh, the hair on the right is Sam G4DDK, who will be here tomorrow to, to put all this on in the radio shack just above this room. So if you're going to be here tomorrow and you want something checking out, bring it along. You'll be able to check the noise figure of your equipment. We won't be bringing any other gear like power meters and so on, but just noise figure. Because a lot of people worry about how the receiver's working. Um, why haven't I heard anybody? Is my receiver duff? We'll be able to find out tomorrow. In fact, there is testing two of my transverters. But getting gear like that is very expensive. That's taken out of the Martlesham, um, the BT, at Astral Park um, labs uh, from their, their test equipment, wheeled in for the day. Because the whole all event takes place on their premises. Not many people have kind, that kind of gear at home. So you've got to make do and mend. We also need to sometimes realign our equipment. Um, it's actually, it's an education when you finally do get a spectrum analyzer like you see here in the picture, to put your gear on it and see how bad it is, particularly commercial equipment. Uh, I shan't mention the commercial company's name because it's going out over the internet and may get sued for libel. But a very well-known piece of two-meter equipment, uh, 
a, a handle that transceive, well, almost a handle, the shoulder mounting thing on the strap, you know the one I mean, uh, made in the Far East. We stuck this on a spectrum analyzer some years back, and it was like a Christmas tree. There were harmonics everywhere and spurious signals. This particular one's got a few on it, but that's just an illustration. So realigning it made a difference. The thing is, people tend to, we were talking earlier about tuning for maximum smoke. And as amateurs, we tend to look at the meters and we tune it up for maximum. Push it as hard as you can. That's the wrong way. You should tune it up for maximum purity. For that, you really need an analyzer. We also test to find faults. Well, when I were a lad, <laughs> and I didn't build this. This is a picture nicked off the internet. Uh, some American, if he's watching this, you did a good job in those days, but I wouldn't do it now. You just built point to point with those big fat resistors that when they burnt, they put a smell around your shack and big capacitors that used to blow up and send bits of tin foil all over your, your shack. And things have changed. Look, this is the inside of a... A DB6 NT transverter. They're all very similar, these. The 10 gigs, 5 gigs, 3 gigs. They're all very much the same sort of layout inside. But the components are small, 2 3 millimeters across. Compared with those on there, all your resistors and your gas fets, everything's on there. Inductors, the lot. So it's a little bit harder. But don't let it scare you, because if you're careful, you can still carry out very meaningful tests on that gear. So what have you got already? What have you got in your shack already? Um, I know amongst this audience there's a wide variety of expertise, ranging from not having done very much to people who are high, highly technical and, and work in the business and have got access to sophisticated test gear. So forgive me if some of this is too easy for you. But you've probably got in your house quite a bit of uh, useful test gear already. We still need, of course, to check have we got power on the equipment. It's the most common fault is a power failure, especially when you're out portable. Uh, I remember once getting to the top of Axe Edge, which Richard will know very well, <coughs> got to the trig point. I was in a rush, setting it up on the trig point, using the trig point as a, as a tripod. That's something Richard didn't mention. You can actually drop stuff into the top of the trig point if you know how to get the cap off. Um, and in fact, you can even adopt and buy a a trig point, I believe, and I don't want to look after it, and it's your personal hilltop. Anyway, I was on the top of uh, Axe Edge, and I plugged my headset in, <coughs> and the lead which carried the DC power, and I trod on it, and ripped all the wires out of the plug. But I left my 12-volt soldering iron half an hour's walk away in the car at the bottom of the hill, so I had to go back and do it. Um, and then I needed my meter to make sure it was all working again. So just an ordinary multimeter that you can buy, very cheap, um, is still essential. We still need to check continuity. We get bad leads. When you're out portable, <coughs> that's another big problem. Very often it's the lead connecting the transverter to the IF. <coughs> a dicky lead with usually BNC connectors on, I find, uh, we use for that. And you can pull one in the process of trying to fit it or put it away in your rucksack, and you have problems. So a lot of our low-frequency gear can become part of our microwave stuff. There's what most of you have got or seen in your shack. <coughs> Standard digimeter, analog, and an old uh, AVO type. Another one I made some years ago was this. A lot of the microwave measurements we do and lining up stages in transverters and oscillator chains and multipliers are very tiny voltages and very small changes. So the user, it's, it's pointless trying to line up an oscillator chain or a multiplier with a digital meter. Because by the time you've tuned this little capacitor or adjusted a core, the numbers go up and you keep and you turn and the numbers come behind your turn. So you're in advance of what the meter's reading. You must use an analog meter so you see the needle go up. I now tend to use a spectrum analyzer instead so I can see it even better. So I made this, this is just a little meter, it's got three milliamps full-scale deflection. And that's really handy for a lot of the measurements we're, we're reading. Uh, you see it on a nice big meter, nothing special about it. Uh, you could soon not one up yourself, you just got to make sure that uh, the full scale, this was a, a one milliamp full-scale, so you just got to get the resistors right to make it read the proper scale. And that's one of the most useful pieces of gear, I still use it a lot when I get time to build. 
Uh, you can, of course, go mad and buy a more advanced digital multimeter, but it still won't be any use for you doing these very minute adjustments for maximum RF out. You need an analog meter. I bought those two at a rally, the two for five pounds. Uh, what make are you? I've forgotten the name now. Schlumberger, I think. Yeah, two for five pounds. They're excellent. I've got, I, I tend to have two of everything in my shack. That's one of the problems. So uh, that's my bench digimeter, and uh, that's very useful, so that's always there. And then those little handheld ones I stick in my box to go portable. Of course, you may have already got a grid deposillator of some sort working on the DC bands, i.e. below 1 gigahertz. And these are still useful because a lot of our microwave gear starts at round about 100 megs, the oscillators, even now in the days of um, digital synthesizers and all those more esoteric oscillators, a lot of us still start with a 100 odd meg crystal and we multiply it up to a microwave frequency. And we need to make sure that the low frequency stages of that crystal oscillator chain are working properly. So, you know, we might need to have a look and, and resonate different circuits. So that's still very, very useful. Don't throw it out. This is a very cheap signal generator. I think I, I bought that at a rally for £10 or something. It's an old Lodestar. It's quite a reputable one. And it goes up on harmonics up to about 400 odd megs, 500 megs, quite useful. Um, you can line up um, IFs with it. You, you, can, you can modulate it to give you a signal. It's, it's really a very useful tool. Or you can go mad and spend money and buy a more sophisticated signal generator like this Marconi one, which goes up to just over a gig. These are available on eBay from time to time. I'm not sure what the cost is these days, probably hundreds of pounds. eBay goes crazy with things like this. People make silly bids. Uh, but this is more like it, and it, A, it looks good on your bench. Uh, you've got to know how to drive it and use it and program it, pressing the buttons there to get the frequencies you want out. But that could be quite a useful one because, as we'll, I'll show later, you can use the output of that set on round about a gigahertz to drive a multiplier to give you signals in all the microwave bands we use, right up to at least 24 gigs, if not more. Sometimes you have audio at the back end of the receiver's got problems and you need some sort of injector, an audio signal. Now, I didn't have an audio oscillator. I bought one later, but I built one, uh, which is here in this box some years back, and it's a Maplin kit. I think it was about 4 99 and it's just a little Velman kit. Uh, and I thought, this is ideal for this. Dead easy. It only took me a, an afternoon or so to put it together. It's in a plastic box. So for about a fiver, or just under, plus the knobs, and the, you've probably got sockets in your junk box, you can make yourself a nice audio oscillator, and it'll give all kinds of waveforms, square wave, uh, sine wave, and whatever. Um, not only is it useful for you lining up your DC gear, I've got a son who's a musician, and he's got these big Marshall amplifiers and stuff. They're always going wrong, and I squirt some of this into it to check it out and look on the scope to see what... I said, this, this is distorted. He said, but that's what I want. I want distortion. <laughs> um, but it's very useful to check that you have them. Very handy. Uh, it's quite good. I've checked it against a, a reasonably decent one, like that one there, the, uh, the Farnell one, which I got. Again, very cheap. All my test gears on the cheap. I've never spent, I think the most I've spent on any test gear, um, well, there's a piece I, I, I haven't told my wife about. It's up there and it's redundant. <laughs> Oh, she's not watching. It was £400 when I bought it. It's not worth that now. But uh, the most out outside that was about 120 quid, And most of it's £15 down. That's a useful function generator too. Peter, she is watching. She is watching, right. <laughs> As a microwaver, though, we, we're going into the higher bands and we've got to start looking at things probably we never thought of before. Frequency of local oscillators and multipliers. We need to be able to measure these to make sure we're on the band. Outside the, the house here, uh, the sports uh, club, is the 5.7 gig beacon up on the roof. I had to make sure that was on frequency, as near as I could get it. Um, and it was a bit of a problem, because I had to bring it up here, and when I got it up here, it went off frequency in the first two weeks. 
And of course, to put it back on frequency, I need to take it back home again because all my frequency measuring gear has been on for the last five or six years and never been switched off. So it's accurate and it's locked to a, um, a, a source that makes it stay on frequency. But I can't bring that up here because it would take days for it to warm up. So uh, it's important to get that right. We need to measure the output of our transmitter. So we need a power meter of some sort, a microwave power meter. And we need to measure the noise figure of our receivers to see how they're working. And perhaps we need to measure the gain of our antennas. Well, if you brought an antenna, David G6GHK will help you to measure the gain of it. But I'll show you some other ways you can do it at home. Let's have a look at frequency measurement first. But if you've got no counter anything, I have to say that the nearest thing you've got is probably your homebrew transceiver, uh, your, uh, your, your transceiver at home, your HF transceiver. They're not brilliant, they can be off frequency and they do drift, but they're better than nothing. When I built the beacon, I wanted to see if the 120 meg oscillator worked, so I just switched on my FT847, dialed up 120 megs, and there it was loud and clear. So I knew it was working okay, and I proceeded from there later. I also used it when I was checking the deviation of the beacon because I wanted to shift it, uh, I think, about 8 hertz because it was multiplied up to 5.7 to give 400 and something hertz shift. And I could just hear the shift. I could hear that the, it was actually frequency shift keying. So that's a good start. But don't count on it being really accurate. They're passable as a, as a reasonable standard. Um, that's an FT8. Oh, it's not. It's an IC706, isn't it? That's right. Um, and they're quite good because they've got a good, good range. They cover all, all the bands right up to 70 centimetres. Oh, one thing, I'll go back to that. I'll put down there at the bottom. You can actually use a rig like this to drive a diode and produce a signal in the microwave bands. I saw that done many years ago by friend of mine who's now silent key and he, he, he set it up on 144 megs, drove this diode really hard with about half a watt and got very usable signals into some of the microwave bands. Again they won't be spot on but they'll put a signal in the band and then you can adjust your receiver and tune the stages up to get maximum smoke again. From time to time at rallies you'll see these things, wave meters, some of them look pretty ancient, and they are. The one that's on the left there is very similar to this. This is actually very high in frequency. I think this goes up to uh, 60 gigahertz. You, if you're going into microwaves now, you'll not be worried about going to 60 gigs, believe me. And it starts at 39.1, but you can get them for different ranges. This is waveguide in and out, and you just tune it. Um, how do you tune this one? I don't know. There we are. <coughs> And you have a detector, you feed a signal through the waveguide, you have a detector at the other end, uh, usually using a, some sort of splitter to get low power into the detector, and you turn the knob here till you get a dip on your meter reading. And that'll give you a rough idea which, that you're in the band. When I started on 10 gigs, all I had was that wave meter on the right-hand side. And I turned it, I had it fixed on the equipment while I was out portable, and a little meter with a detector diode in it and tuned that to make sure it was actually in the band. But in those days we were using gun oscillators and we were lucky to be within in 10 or 20 megs of the band. We now expected some people, one of them present here, to be within 10 or 20 hertz of the frequency on that, on that band. So the standards have really gone up. But don't let that put you off. Of course, you can go and buy a frequency standard or, and or a counter. Counters can be very, very cheap. I did bring one, which uh, I think I've got over here. Yes, here it is. This, again, was a two-pound job at a rally. It was on a bench, and nobody wanted it. I couldn't be... This was at um, Donington. It's, uh, it's a black, black star, and it goes up to 2.4 gigs. Two quid. And it's got the facility for locking it with a reference oscillator. Now, I have a very high stability reference oscillator. So I stick that in, and it's pretty good. Can't grumble. Uh, I've got another counter, which uh, is about half a, half a gig. And uh, I have to use what's called a prescaler to read frequencies higher than half a gig. Thank you. Uh, the prescaler I have brought here. 
little old maid job. So you stick this in front of your half gig counter, your 500 meg counter, and that'll read up to almost three gigs, which is about all I ever find I need to read because most of the gear I build has got stages, and by the time I've got the 2.5 gigs, 2.4 gigs, my next multiplication is times four or five up to 10G. And I'm gonna hear that anyway, I'm gonna measure it. So this is quite useful, that just goes in line into the input. It's one of those sockets there. Plug 12 volts into it. You've got to be careful that you don't overload it. Uh, and some of them can actually take off if you don't have a load on them of some sort. It gets pretty squiggles all over the place. But two pounds. Keep going to support your local rallies, which are fast disappearing. I gather we're losing one this year. No Elvis. Um, some years ago, we did have uh, a very useful way of getting a, a, a high stability source to lock our counters with. <clears throat> that was MSF on 60 kilohertz. Now it's moved north and I've not really bothered with it since. In fact, I, what I'm showing you now, I haven't used for a long time because I've got more sophisticated gear. But years ago I used to uh, listen to MSF and with this bit of gear here, which I, I can take the lid off if you want to see in it later. Um, this is basically an MSF receiver that's a ferrite rod with an active uh, sort of an antenna amplifier in that, and it sends it down this coax. The power also goes up the coax to, f to power the uh, transistor that's in there. That's another thing, perhaps, with home stations. You can send your DC up the coax you're using. The control voltages can go up the coax. And then uh, you, you switch this on, and you'll see this meter here swing from side to side, and eventually it'll stop swinging, and with a bit of luck, it'll stay in the middle. Now, I'll leave it on for a while. And you've got yourself, uh, in this case, what did I get out of here? Uh, 108 megs and 12 megs. And the 108 megs is a magic, one of the magic numbers, like 96 megs. You'll find when you relate them to the 10 gig microwave band, you can multiply them up and they'll put you in the 10G band and I think one or two others. I can't do sums in my head, I'm afraid. But uh, that was quite a useful tool. I think you can buy commercial versions of that, but they're locked on to other things. Is it DCF in Germany or uh, other sources of radio? And also to the droit which long wave uh, broadcast, which is a bit of a problem because it's got modulation on it. If you're going to build your own, you've got to get rid of that modulation. And it's on 198 KCs instead of 200, which is a bit more awkward. The other one uh, on the right-hand side of the picture there is what was called the poor man's cesium clock. <clears throat> and basically what this did, and that's here, it's a circuit that appeared in Radcom many years ago, and I still think it's useful, although I must say I haven't used it for ages. Um, I don't know, perhaps Bernie knows, whether there's still analog TV from Germany on the old Astra satellite. Yeah. It's still there, is it? Because one of them, ZDF, uh, is cesium or rubidium locked, and it's sync pulse generator is highly stable and what this does is select the SPG out of the TV signal which you get from your old-fashioned Allen Sugar type TV system, analog system. Uh, I've got one up there especially for that. It comes down into here. This sorts out the, si the signal. I think there's a circuit following it here. Yeah, there we are. Um, I'm not delving into this too much because of the time factor. But the, the, uh, the video is coming down here, and by the t it, it um, selects the signal and then divides it right down, and then it's used as a reference to, uh, to lock a 10 meg crystal here. And at the, I got out of this a 10 meg output, a 1 meg output. The 10 meg locks my counter. It doesn't now, I've got better equipment to do it, but it, it keeps your counter in the ballpark. Uh, that's, I think, sort of late 90s in Radcom somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, you can't do it with the modern British digital. They're all over the place. They're not locked at all. Oh, it's everywhere. Uh, there was even a problem when we were analog, because um, uh, one or two, if you were, it depends which network. When they were switching networks, you found your meter was all over the place in between switching networks. I used to find Channel 4 quite good and BBC, but ITV were terrible. But it's still useful. I'm not sure if the boards are still available. You can make your own. You can do it on Veriboard. You don't have to make it on PC. But that's another thing. A lot of these, this stuff doesn't have to be made on a posh PC. 
board. You can do it dead bug style, ugly style. There's what's it called a skyscraper thing, what they call it. Manhattan. Yeah, Manhattan thing, that's right. Uh, and it, it might look rubbish, but put it in a nice box, and it looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> Actually, that looks quite good inside, because it's got a, quite a proper PC board. Of course, the modern thing now is to use GPS. Now, on, on eBay, uh, there's, there was quite a glut of these little modules. These are called the Jupiter GPS module. Uh, that's the TU3.